Today's speaker is Dr. Carolyn Mattingly, an Associate Professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at North Carolina State University. Carolyn is the Principal Investigator of the Comparative Toxicogenomics Database, an effort to curate literature on the associations between chemicals, genes, and diseases. She also leads a research effort using zebrafish as a model organism to investigate the mechanisms of toxicity to endocrine disrupting compounds. This morning, she will be focusing on their recent efforts to integrate information on exposures into the CTD. With a final reminder to submit your questions via email during the presentation to exposo at niehs.nih.gov, I will hand the podium over to Dr. Mattingly. Carolyn? Thanks, David. Um, and it's a little weird not to be able to see everybody, so um, thank you for joining us. And um, I'm happy to be here to talk to you today about uh, CTD, or the Comparative Toxicogenomics Database, and in particular, um, a separate initiative that we started a few years ago and um, that is now released and integrated within CTD that is specific to exposure science. So. I'm hoping to give you a little bit of background about CTD in case there are um, some of you who are not familiar with it and and then tell you a little bit more about this new data set that we've integrated and give you some examples about how um, one might use these data in trying to better understand how the environment is affecting human health. So CTD, uh, we've been working on this project now since about 2001. Um, it was first publicly released in 2004. And the impetus for it was really um, knowing that most diseases, most chronic diseases, have some environmental component, um, but that we really don't know what most of the chemicals in the environment are doing. And at the time, we were looking at a lot of databases that were popping up, but that none of them were really focusing on the environmental piece. And so um, we really tried to address that gap. And we approached this through uh, a number of different mechanisms, so looking at public data sets that we could bring into um, a sort of integrated environment, um, but also bring together information specific to the environment that was coming from the literature. And although PubMed is a, an incredible resource, as, as we all know, it's, it's also very, very large. And so trying to pull out relationships that are occurring between small entities within the published literature landscape can be a little bit challenging. So. What we did was focus our our efforts on curation of the literature, or pulling out specific pieces of information that we thought would help um, provide more information about what chemicals were doing, um, particularly mechanisms by which um, they may be modulating environmentally uh, related diseases. So we looked at the literature and focused on interactions between chemicals and genes or, or proteins. So when I refer to genes in this talk, I'm also talking about proteins and various forms of the gene. Um, we don't discriminate on that level. Um, we also were interested in looking at gene disease relationships and chemical disease relationships and seeing sort of where the data for these types of um, binary relationships fell and thinking about, well, if we could pull out these binary relationships, which were really um, the focus of individual papers. There are very few papers that, that really address all of these relationships, but instead focus on one aspect, but maybe disconnected from another, um, but potentially related aspect. So we focused on that. And the way in which we had to do that was to think about um, doing it in the most structured way so that we knew we would be pulling out the data in a very consistent fashion. And then once those data were put into a database, that would be available and helpful to the user who's looking for information. And you can put in one term. Someone else can put in a synonym of that term. But everybody comes up with the same results. And so um, we chose to use a number of different control vocabularies to address these different aspects of data relationships. 
for chemicals. Currently, we use um, the National Library of Medicine's MeSH vocabulary for genes. We use the Entree Gene vocabulary. Um, and as I mentioned, genes um, also comprise mRNA protein, promoter regions of genes, et cetera. Um, for diseases, we use MeSH. Um, for our chemical gene interactions, uh, we looked around in the public domain for ontologies that would address this and um, actually ended up coming up with our own. Um, and then for species, um, I should mention for chemical gene relationships, we curate these, these interactions across vertebrates and invertebrates um, because the majority of toxicology data is is not done in humans, so um, we use the species vocabulary from NCBI for that, and this will become a little more significant later. So why do we use these um, semantic standards? Well, as a lot of us know, um, language and data in the literature are not very well standardized, and you can see in this first column these all these symbols describe the same exact gene. And so you can find all these references within the literature, but would not necessarily know, unless you, this is your field, that those are the same gene. And similarly, all of these chemicals in the right column, um, or, or all these terms, rather, describe the same chemical. And so using standards that account for all of these synonyms um, would help us both from a curation perspective so that our curators can go into the literature and, and be able to identify what gene or chemical or disease is being talked about. And then from a user perspective, you would be able to put in any of these terms and, and identify the data associated with it. The other piece of that is that if we're using standards to describe each of these entities, whether it's chemicals, genes, or diseases, that leverages um, a whole set of other data in the public domain that we can then bring into CTD. So genes are a good example of that. Um, by using these standard gene symbols, we're able to incorporate into CTD um, gene ontology annotations, which describe um, the function of proteins, Reactome and KEG, which are pathway databases, and then, for example, BioGrid, which describes gene-gene interactions and, and regulatory mechanisms. So these standards, although um, are not the most exciting things to talk about, they actually are the bread and butter if you're trying to um, integrate a lot of different data sets that that users are, are now increasingly expecting to have access to seamlessly in, in public resources. So not only integrating provides access, but it also provides other functionality um, for analysis. And I'll show you some examples of that um, a little bit later. So our vision then was that <clears throat> by virtue of curating this information from the literature, we would sort of revive literature that, that may have really significant findings about chemical interactions on diseases and bring them into a different context and allow people to make connections. So for example, if you were interested in the heavy metal cadmium, you could come to CTD and you would find about 2,400 genes or proteins for which there's evidence in the literature that cadmium interacts with or affects their um, expression or function. Um, these genes are associated with um, many different diseases. Um, and by virtue of bringing all of this information together, then you might be able to hypothesize that cadmium is affecting um, a number of these different diseases. And you can get even more specific. So if you're interested in diabetes, for instance, and whether or not cadmium has some connection to it, you would then be able to identify um, 17 different genes. And these 17 genes have curated relationships to cadmium, and they also have curated relationships to diabetes. Um, and these 17 genes are known to be enriched in osteogenic and adipogenic pathways, which could be important in um, diabetes in terms of um, whether or not stem cell populations are being pushed into um, adipogenic 
directions or osteogenic directions. So the the goal of this database is is essentially to pull together this information and allow people to make um, connections to information that they might not otherwise be able to make. So the way that we do this is to go into the literature. So we use PubMed, and we have pretty extensive um, query mechanisms by which we um, query it. But we also have some uh, automated ranking techniques. And we've extensively documented this. And one of our software developers, Tom Wiggers, has been very, very involved in um, the BioCreative Initiative, um, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, which is an international consortia that tries to bring together people who are interested in text mining and natural language processing to figure out how we can better mine the biological literature. So we have a number of papers um, in which CTD data has been really important in some of the challenges that this group puts out. So once we um, triage the literature, uh, we have some automated web-based tools that our curators um, then go into the literature. Um, we have ways of highlighting some of the, the salient pieces of information, yet at the end of the day, the curators are manually curating this information. Um, we have a shorthand that we show here. Um, and this tool is, is quite nifty because these interactions, for example, this one is uh, C1 is describing a chemical. It's increasing the expression of G1, which is, in this case, an ABC transporter, um, but the mRNA level of it. So um, they can get quite extensive and complicated, and this tool responds in real time to whatever sort of string the user or the curator puts in. And then we capture a number of other bits of information um, about the, uh, the paper. We also have some QC measures um, that interact directly with our curation application. And then once they pass through, they, uh, the data gets loaded monthly into the database. So, um, <clears throat> so once that happens, um, you have access to it. And this is just a quick view of where sort of what we refer to now as core CTD um, is. We have over a million chemical gene interactions. The data reflects over 500 different organisms. Um, and you can read the numbers. Pretty extensive um, gene and chemical disease associations. And um, essentially, the bottom line is this is where the landscape is as far as curated data that we have for chemicals, diseases, and genes. And again, um, genes, we have 39,000 because of the diversity of organisms that are represented um, in the database. OK, so this is the URL for the database, which is um, completely open and free. Um, so you have a number of different ways you can access the information. Um, most people go in through a keyword search. Um, you can put in chemicals, genes, diseases, go terms, um, pathways. Um, or you can go to more advanced search queries, which allow you to, to build more complex searches. But most people, as I mentioned, use the keyword search. <clears throat> so once you're in the database, and I'll give you a view uh, from a chemical perspective, because this is typically how our users are entering the database. But if you can imagine, there are um, comparable pages for genes and diseases, um, as well as uh, gene ontology and pathway data. So for the cadmium information, we, we bring in some data from other public databases. Excuse me. <clears throat> so for, for instance, MeSH, we provide um, all of the information you would sort of expect for CAD, for different chemicals, so CAS IDs. We provide you with a, a brief definition, um, a structure. We give you the a quick view of the top genes that we have curated data for. And then, of course, we provide you with all kinds of links to other databases that have um, additional information about the chemicals um, that you might be interested in. So the, data, the curated data that we provide is, is presented along the top here. 
um, in a tabbed format. So gene interactions, you would go to a page such as this, and you see cadmium, you see your interacting gene, and then this is the output from that curation application that I showed you. So while the curators put in sort of a shorthand, you actually get a readable sentence. Um, and these can, again, get get very complex. They can be as simple as binding or affecting other um, types of reactions. You always have access to the references that are associated with um, that curated interaction as well as the organisms. By and large, the data is mostly from um, rats and mice, as you would expect, but um, there is an increasing number of data for other organisms um, model systems such as Drosophila and zebrafish and C. elegans. <clears throat> um, a lot of people really like the disease page, so this is, I think, one of the most unique aspects of CTD that we can bring together the information about um, chemi potential chemical influences on diseases, and at the end of the day, that's what we're we're trying to help uh, elucidate. So. What we've done is, because we have pretty extensive disease vocabulary, and um, I should mention our disease vocabulary and our chemical vocabulary are both hierarchical, so that allows users to ask um, questions about very broad categories of chemicals or diseases or very specific. Um, what we show you down here is at the specific level, um, but these are also mapped into categories. So if you want sort of a, a quick view at what sorts of diseases seem to be um, associated with cadmium, you can click on that, and what you would see is a table such as this. And we distinguish between um, diseases that have curated relationships versus those that are inferred, and I'll explain that in a moment. But this kind of gives you a, a quick view of nervous system diseases seem to be the most highly correlated um, with cadmium and so on. Um, so if you look at the main part of that page, we have this direct evidence column. And what this is telling you is that there is an association between cadmium and, in this case, prostate cancer that is founded in one or more pieces of literature. Um, so this M is indicating that that relationship may be mechanistic and that cadmium may contribute to prostate cancer. You can also have a T here. So we do have um, many drugs in the database as well. And so if you see a T, then that indicates that that chemical is used as a therapy for that particular disease. So this would be considered a curated relationship if, this, um, if there is some icon in this direct evidence column. However, we also create what we call inferred relationships. Um, and that is based on this inference network. And so in this particular case, what you see is we would have, even in the absence of this direct evidence, we would have created a relationship between cadmium and prostate cancer because we have curated information between cadmium and this set of 149 genes as well as between prostate cancer and this 149 um, gene set. So that would be an inferred relationship. We have developed an inference score to try to um, essentially rank these inferences. And this is um, a, a point of a lot of discussion. And we're always interested in, in people's feedback on how to do this. And what we developed this initially because people would ask us, well, is this inference network true? And well, of course, we don't know that. It's intended to be hypothesis driving. Um, but what this inference score is a reflection of is the set of genes and essentially its uniqueness with respect to its relationship to cadmium and, in this case, prostate cancer. And so inference scores typically will track um, higher with larger sets of genes, as you might expect. Um, and we're doing some analysis now, um, which we were just talking about this morning, that is sort of evaluating whether or not those inference scores are really turning out to 
correlate with relationships that have direct evidence in the literature, and it looks like it's actually um, highly predictive of those. So I um, don't have the data in this presentation to show you that at the moment, but hopefully we will be putting something together soon for uh, the community to, to get a better handle on what these inference scores mean. So once you're looking at, oh, and then you can always access the references that are um, founding, uh, are underlying these curated relationships. So if we look at one particular example, just to show you what other information we provide for you, um, these icons in here provide enrichment analysis, and these are based on these genes. So if you look at a set of 81 genes, that's not particularly helpful. Um, but you can get a little better idea about what that set of genes might be uh, associated with by doing a Go enrichment. So um, this is just a snapshot of what that might look like. So response to lipids. Um, in, this in this case, we're looking at cadmium and hypertension. You have um, significant associations with things like blood circulation that you might expect in hypertension. Um, this icon here. Um, gives you an idea of enriched pathways that are associated with this set of genes. And then this icon here um, is based on gene-gene interactions associated with these genes. So it's basically telling you, among this set of 81 genes, what do we know in terms of um, whether or not these genes actually talk to one another in a cellular context? And um, all this information is hyperlinked to the details, and these circles are these particular genes in here, and their shading and size reflect the amount of data that underlies uh, those relationships. So this is sort of the, that was um, just sort of the backdrop to the, the resource that we were hoping to build on to address some of the needs in the exposure community. Um, so what I just described to you, as I mentioned, we call core CTD now. Um, and a, a number of years ago, uh, we were involved in an exposure meeting and were approached um, and asked if, if we thought we would be able to do something similar for exposure science data. And none of us on the team are exposure scientists, so we spent some time trying to figure out what that actually meant. Um, and since then, as we know, this has um, been increasing in interest to the community through the Exposome project. And um, what we did at the time was to try to understand what the need was of the exposure community. And what was communicated to us was that there was really a need to centralize exposure data, that this information was being published, but it was sort of getting lost in in um, the landscape of PubMed, and it was very difficult to sort of look across exposure studies to identify them at all, and that many of these exposure studies were also sort of um, in isolation relative to a broader biological framework, so epidemiological studies that, that may correlate a chemical and a disease outcome, but in the absence of molecular data or measurements of chemicals in the environment that may be um, separate from actual disease outcomes. And we felt like CTD may actually have some of that broader framework that we could contribute to some of the interpretation or expanding um, out some of the implications of exposure science studies. And then on the flip side of that, we have a large amount, the majority of the data in CTD was really based on experimental studies. And for those of us that do studies in the laboratory, we know there's always that question of, um, you know, whether what we're doing is really reflective of the real world. And so we saw this as an opportunity to bring in some of the community and population-based data um, more deliberately and, and sort of bring that real-world context to um, the experimental data on which we had been previously focusing. So that raised an issue of, well, what exactly do we need to curate and how do we do this? Because we're talking about very different, um, there's some commonality, but some very different pieces of data than what we had been um, curating. 
So we brought together a working group of exposure scientists uh, as well as ontology folks <clears throat> and and underwent this sort of iterative process for what amounted to about a year and a half of work. So we had um, assessed really what the landscape of exposure science data looked like and then started looking at what actually these papers were reporting and what kinds of terms and what kinds of categories of data could be um, identified from what turned out to be an incredibly diverse set of information. And we had the exposure scientists who were working with us who were not curators um, sort of take on the task of trying to curate these data, which was um, a lot of fun for us because I think it, it um, helped them gain some appreciation for the fact that this is, is not an easy task and it was really helpful for us because they're the exposure scientists and they could advise us on um, what were the most important pieces of information um, that should come out of of these particular papers. So we went around and around with this um, and kept expanding on um, terms and categories that needed to be reflected in um, the curation process and eventually came out with um, the fundamental structure, which um, consisted of an exposure stressor. So in, in our world, that is primarily chemicals, but there was um, this what we came up with was very much of a skeleton that could be expanded and, and a lot of detail could be added. So obviously stressors can be more than chemicals and there's room within the structure to add things like um, demographic information, psychosocial stressor, things like that. Um, exposure receptor would consist of um, population-based information. So if you're looking at a study of um, workers in a factory, for instance, an exposure event um, really described the types of measurements that these papers were um, providing information about. So levels of chemicals in blood and urine, biomarkers that were looked at, um, geography of where the exposure took place, etc. And then exposure outcomes. So these could be phenotypes, they could be diseases, and again, they could be expanded out for um, other uses, and this became what we called the, the structure for the exposure ontology, and we put this out to the community um, through um, a manuscript and and made the ontology public with the hope that, you know, people would expand it as needed. Um, so this helped us sort of figure out the how. It, it framed the type of information that we needed to provide, but then at the end of the day, we have to come up with a, a paradigm that allows us to curate data in a reasonable way, um, make it useful to the community, but it can't be so um, onerous that you know days are spent on a particular paper because that wouldn't be so efficient. And the landscape of exposure data is super diverse. So um, we have, so this is an example of a paper, and again, we have our stressor, receptor, event, and outcome. We have papers where all of these aspects are reflected and, and studied in a paper, but we have other ones where, you know, maybe a stressor and a receptor are included. So a particular chemical is measured in participants, um, but there's no outcome data. And then yet other examples where particular pollutants may be measured and and they're really not in the context of a population. And so we wanted a structure that would allow us to capture all of these different scenarios. Um, and that, that took some time too. And eventually um, what we ended up with was um, figuring out not only how to incorporate this structure into CTD, so these stressors, um, meshed um, really nicely with the chemicals that we were already curating in core CTD, and these exposure outcomes overlap really nicely with diseases that we were already curating in CTD, yet they added the, all of this new information. And as we started curating, um, of course, a lot of detail uh, was added to each of these particular um, 
sort of high-level categories. And so XO has now expanded quite a bit um, just based on the process of our curation. And so at the end of the day, we're now capturing um, 34 different data points. So I'll give you a little view of what that looks like, um, sort of the administrative information, um, we provide information about the stressors, so what is it that was being measured, what is the source of that particular, and in this case, I'm going to focus on chemicals, because um, that's really the focus of our curation at the moment. Um, we have details about the stressor sources, so these can be factories, um, for example. For our exposure receptors, we have um, a lot of different information about the population. So, um, and we also have information um, that is free text. But for the most part, we try to capture all of this information with very structured terms. Um, and hopefully, you'll, you'll appreciate why when I show you some examples. The biggest component of this is the exposure event. So we capture all of the actual um, levels of chemicals and biomarkers that are measured. Um, and you can see the, the extent of the information here. And then finally, the exposure outcomes. So in addition to just diseases, we also include anatomical sites, so a level of specificity that um, we hadn't been previously capturing. A number of these, um, so although we we sort of developed the exo structure, um, we're using a lot of terms that overlap with existing ontologies, and so we're um, leveraging those where possible to reduce redundancy. Um, and this updated version of EXO should be available soon, both on our database as well as a number of other public resources that um, are interested in, in sort of putting ontologies out there to, to the community. So what does this look like in CTD now? <clears throat> so again, you can still search for chemicals. Um, again, here's sort of a high-level term if you were interested in metals. Um, you would get your um, typical um, view as you would in core CTD. So this is all of these data, our first phase of curated data is um, fully integrated with CTD. So you would come to CTD and see no difference um, until you start digging into the data. The query mechanisms are all the same. Um, <clears throat> so we've added a new icon. So this icon indicates that there is exposure data associated with these particular terms. Um, if you were to focus more specifically on heavy metals, um, what you would see is, again, a chemical page similar to what I showed you before and a new tab that we call exposure studies. And what that shows you then is um, for this particular page for heavy metals, we have 198 exposure studies that have been curated. Um, we provide the stressor agent. So what that means is um, the chemical that the the actual group was trying to um, identify. Um, and again, um, whatever your, your query term was um, would be highlighted. Um, Let's see. Okay. Um, if you looked at a particular example, um, such as this one, so we're showing you um, the receptor. So this is sort of the high-level view of it. So what was studied in this in this paper? So residents and workers. In this case, residents. You get information about the study location, what was actually um, measured, and in what sort of medium. Um, and then any disease or phenotype outcomes. We provide an author summary. So this is sort of a help as in the case where you might have something like 198 results. Um, you might want sort of a quick view as to what the, the goal of that particular paper was. And as always, you have access to the original reference. So you have this one study per view. Um, and again, here are all the details of um, the information you can get. 
Now, if you want actual details of what the measurements are um, that this particular study provided, you can click on that particular paper or you can go to details and what you would see is something like this. So this page is now specific to that study and you can see this is the exposure details tab for that study. Um, you have the number of receptors, so there are different um, categories. So in this case, you have residents in a non-polluted area versus residents in a moderately polluted area. You can see the actual levels of cadmium that were measured in this particular population and um, various statistics that were used um, to sort of uh, contextualize these these groups of um, individuals in the population. We also provide the outcomes or disease phenotypes, so we tell you whether there was a positive correlation or a negative correlation um, to a particular disease, um, such as kidney disease, albumin albuminuria, um, or phenotypes, so renal, renal system processes in this case. Um, these, as, as throughout CTD, everything is sort of reciprocally curated. So if you go to a disease page, you would be able to access this information or a phenotype page. Um, so you can always get to the information through a number of different mechanisms. So in this case, if you were interested in renal system processes, again, you could go to exposure studies. You would find that there are five studies that have been curated for exposure data that um, in this case here's the study we had been looking at and here are some other studies for which um, renal system process was a phenotype that was focused on in, in um, a particular study. So then you can also go to particular disease pages for the same reason, find other studies that look at the same disease. Now core CTD, by, by virtue of its integration, um, we can add more information, as I said. So this is sort of the reciprocal providing real world context to core CTD, but core CTD can also provide information for the exposure. So in this example, um, we can bring together the previously curated information for this group of exposure stressors, and what this does is for exposure studies, we may have 53 diseases that are associated with particulate matter. In core or more experimentally based data, there are more diseases, so we provide sort of an additional context for that. In some cases, these are highly related. They may be more granular um, diseases that were looked at in an experimental context. Um, similarly, we can provide genes. In many of the exposure studies, there are, there's very little molecular data. Um, they tend to be epidemiological studies or studies in which a chemical is measured in um, household dust, for example. And that, that's great for providing sort of real-world context, but it doesn't tell you a whole lot about mechanism. But once you bring these two pieces together, then you can grab the mechanism data from core CTD and add that to um, the exposure context. Um, and then again, a lot of these data are coming from cross-species studies, and so um, our goal, too, is that we can sort of help figure out um, which of these model systems are, are going to be corroborated by exposure data um, in the literature or help to inform which model systems may be the best ones for looking at more mechanistic studies following exposure um, reports. So I wanted to show you a couple um, use cases as to how we envision um, this information being able to be used. And, and again, this, this, these data have only been integrated for about two months, and we're continuing to curate these data. So as the data sets become more robust, there'll be a lot more we can do with this. So this is an interesting paper that was um, published by Lyle Burgoon, who um, some of you probably know. And 
Um, he was looking at uh, race and socioeconomic factors um, associated with particular diseases, and in this case it was um, type 2 diabetes. And they found that there were different genetic susceptibilities to type 2 diabetes that were connected to a particular SNP in a um, transporter, this SLC30A8. And this was associated with particular um, subsets of the population, in, um, specifically Mexican-Americans. Um, and so they looked then at where these um, populations may be um, enriched in a particular geographic area. And they were focusing on California and found that there may be, their conclusion at the end of the day um, was that there may be a higher percentage of susceptible individuals living in the Los Angeles area versus San Francisco um, susceptibil with susceptibility to type 2 diabetes. And what they suggested at the, in this paper at the end was that a natural extension would be then to look at, and the interesting thing was, I should step back, they, they took a lot of public data sets um, to come up with this analysis, which seemed like a, a great idea. There's a, an amazing amount of information out there that, when integrated, can, can give us different views about um, either health disparities or susceptibilities. And the piece that was not yet incorporated into this was really the environmental piece. And so are there, are there data sets out there that can tell us something about, okay, if this um, population in Los Angeles is does have a higher susceptibility to diabetes, is there environmental information there that that might actually um, support that and, and indicate that these people have an even higher risk due to environmental exposures that they may be experiencing? So um, Alan Davis, who's um, our lead curator, put together um, this analysis, which I thought was very clever. And just looking at the state of the exposure data we've curated so far, so far there are 63 um, exposure studies that focus in California. Um, these papers have curated <clears throat> relationships between about 190 um, exposure stressors in um, almost 100 different counties and towns. And um, these stressors have been associated with a number of different diseases. So if you focus um, particularly on studies in the Los Angeles area, this included eight different articles with 27 different stressors, um, and here are a number of those particular stressors. And <clears throat> what he did was he took these stressors then and said, what do we know about these based on core CTD data, and found that, in fact, there were quite a, a few correlations between these particular um, environmental stressors and diabetes-related uh, conditions consistent with um, what Lyle had shown as being potentially a higher um, susceptibility population in this area. So it could be, at the end of the day, that we can take some of, of this geographic information and exposure information and connect it to try to understand then what the mechanisms might be. So core CTD can take that even farther and say, okay, what do we know about these particular relationships, such as um, between particulate matter and diabetes, and go back into our core data set uh, where we have, again, here's the particulate matter page and core, core CTD on your disease page. Um, you would see that there is a, co a correlation between particulate matter and diabetes. There is evidence in the literature for that. And then we provide you with this inference network. So these are 44 genes that may help to explain that connection between particulate matter and diabetes. And then what we can do for that is look at what those genes are. And in fact, there are more um, transporters, particularly glucose transporters, as well as PPARs that we know to be involved in lipid balance, and conduct some further analyses and identify some potential pathways that might be worth exploring further. Um, in, in thinking about how particulate matter may be influencing um, diabetes incidence. 
So, and then further, you can um, go back into, here I jumped to that quickly, so this is just particulate matter and diabetes. Um, if you go to particulate matter and the exposure studies tab up here, then again you get a whole list, and this is just a partial list of um, other disorders that may be associated with particulate matter. So another example, and we just submitted a paper um, to EHP um, <clears throat> that's under review at the moment, um, talking about this exposure module to CTD, and in it we included this example. So one of the, the studies that we have focused on heavily is the agricultural health study, um, which many of you may be familiar with, um, and Jane Hoppen, who um, is now in in our toxicology program here at State and was um, critical in, in this study and continues to be, helped us a lot with this. So we set out to curate the, the whole of the Ag Health study. Um, there are now 111 publications associated with this study. Yet, to our surprise, there hadn't been a meta-analysis done, and so we wondered if the information that we had curated, what we could actually do with it at this initial stage. So among the 111 publications, um, we reviewed them all. 99 of them contained eligible data, um, eligible in the CTD world, which meant that it had to have um, some sort of um, <clears throat> measurable chemical um, and have specific chemicals or diseases um, implicated. Um, so these 99 publications had 62 um, chemical stressors that were focused on, 46 disease outcomes, um, and these exposure statements. So these are um, things akin to those measurements I showed you um, um, on an earlier page. And so we took those data and said, well, what does the Ag Health Study data actually look like if you looked at it from, you know, a thousand foot view? So we wanted to, to just take a simple approach and use something like a heat map. And we looked across the data and, of course, in some cases there are positive correlations. Um, in some cases there are negative. In some cases, um, endpoints hadn't been looked at with certain chemicals but had been in others. So there's a range of types of, um, of different interactions that have been curated. And in some cases, there were conflicting data. And so we developed a metric, and I'm just showing you what these colors mean um, for the heat map here. And I realize this is probably impossible to read depending on what screen you have. Um, but essentially, it's a heat map that is showing you um, chemicals on the bottom, diseases and phenotypes on the right, and we've categorized them here. Um, so this upper category are neurological disorders. <clears throat> In yellow here we have cancers, uh, respiratory disorders, thyroid-related, metabolic-related disorders, and then some other um, sort of one-offs. And this this starts to get pretty interesting if you start looking at, well, where are you seeing overlaps? And you get a set of chemicals here that um, might not be too surprising that they're clustering together, but their associations um, range from diabetes to respiratory diseases to prostate cancer. Um, and then again, some of these overlap between prostate cancer and Parkinson's disease. And so this we felt was kind of a, a neat way of sort of getting a high-level view at where the data are. And, and the goal is to have this sort of functionality eventually in CTD where you could take multiple studies and, and look at how the data is falling out with respect to um, disease and phenotype associations. So we also took this a little bit farther and said, okay, we have these pesticides that um, were associated with prostate cancer here, and you can look across um, this row. And we leverage the inference networks that we have in CTD, because again, there's not a lot in the studies that are underlying these connections, there's not a lot of molecular data, so we can go to those inference networks such as this um, in CTD and say which genes are associated with each of those chemical disease associations. 
And so what we came up with was a set of about 200 unique genes that were associated with um, 16 different pesticides. And in order to keep this a little more manageable, then we restricted the number of genes to those that interacted with at least three of these chemicals um, that showed up in the Ag Health study. And that <clears throat> whittled our list down to about 21 genes, um, which we show here. And in another sort of graphic saying, well, which of these chemicals were these genes associated with? And using CTD functionality, um, we can look at which of those genes are actually interacting with one another. So um, here is one view of, of what that pathway um, could look like. So again, trying to show how we can take the exposure data from a set of epidemiological um, studies and get to a point where we have some potential or hypothetical mechanisms that that might help to explain some of the the chemical disease connections. So those are just two examples. Um, <clears throat> again, this is early in in um, the project. With respect to, we have quite a bit of data. We have about two thousand um, curated papers for a landscape that we estimate to be about four or 5,000 papers. Um, and a lot of this time has been establishing um, our curation protocol. So now that the data is in CTD, what we're focusing on now is um, figuring out ways to provide better access to the data. So for example, um, we will be adding in more specific query mechanism, so you could, for example, look at just the data associated with the Ag Health study or just NHANES data, or if you wanted to look at particular um, attributes of, the, of a population across many different studies, um, we'll give you the capability to do that. We also have a lot of additional data that we're curating that um, just get too big um, to look at in a single page. And so we'll be implementing some mechanisms by which you can filter <clears throat> the data that you want to look at for a particular study. Um, and then finally, just some visualization tools that we're working on where you can um, get an idea of, for a particular chemical, for instance, um, where you might be able to find higher incidences of diseases or exposure, um, both in the U.S. or um, globally. So those are just a few examples of things that we're working on at the moment and hopefully will be released um, in the coming months for users to access. And then I want to just end with one plug for um, <clears throat> semantic challenges. And again, I know this isn't the most exciting thing, but um, going through this process of, of trying to figure out how to capture these really important studies. And as the exposome becomes um, a bigger piece of environmental health research, um, I think these epidemiological studies are going to become really critical parts of the equation, yet their information is, is very, very challenging to fit into a computable form. And a lot of that is because of um, the lack of semantic standards that are being used in papers and studies that are being published, um, and then the lack of standards or consensus among the community about how to maybe capture this information. And I just want to give you a couple examples of, of challenges that we've had to face in terms of figuring out how to capture this information. So um, just the diversity of the study objectives, as I mentioned, we go from epidemiological studies to measuring compounds and house dust. Um, dose measurements, these can be as diverse as um, defined as distance from an exposure source or the time exposed, estimated consumption of contaminated food source, particles per hand wipe. So um, you try to normalize all that and look at results for a particular compound across studies that are using these very, very different types of measurements. It gets pretty, um, pretty hairy fast. Um, biomarker measurements are, are very, very diverse. Statistics have been incredibly difficult, um, and while everybody wants us to include that information, it's 
it's pretty challenging um, because we don't want to get in the business of reevaluating people's data. Um, we don't think it's it's productive. We don't necessarily have the expertise to do that. We defer to um, the authors of these studies. Yet, when you look at the range of statistical approaches that um, people are using, it it's quite challenging. Um, and related to that is determination of statistical significance. So some groups use p-values, other people use odds ratios, and within those odds ratios, different people define significance differently. Um, things like smoking status that you might think would be pretty um, pretty straightforward can be very diversely described, and things like age. So if you want to look at Studies of children, well, how do you define children? Well, some people call them children. Other people give age ranges or means. Um, and so I think these are are really important issues that, that the community um, really needs to address if, if we want these data sets to be incorporated into emerging data um, and integrated into um, resources going forward so that we, we can actually do cross-study analyses. And we had a, a workshop that NIEHS supported that we hosted here at NC State a year ago, uh, a little more than a year ago, um, where we tried to start the conversation about how how to think forward about where the standards are for environmental health um, issues and and how we want to address this so that the community can be on board and report their data in a more standardized way if possible. Um, and to date we have a listserv which I invite you to join if you're interested in being a part of that conversation. So with that, I will stop, and I just want to um, acknowledge the CTD team, which is an amazing group of um, scientists and software and statistician folks who um, do all of the hard work in, in curating and putting the database together, um, collaborators that we have um, here at NC State and outside of NC State, we've been able to really leverage um, uh, growing epidemiological expertise here, particularly with Jane Hoppen um, and and bioinformatics expertise, and of course um, NIEHS has been incredibly supportive of this project, for which um, we're grateful. So I will stop there, and I would be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you.